Please welcome Peter Berg, Visa, and Adam Ludwin, Chain.com. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much to uh, Consensus and Coindesk for having uh, me and Peter here. My name is Adam Ludwin. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Chain. And uh, we are here today with Visa to talk about blockchain networks. So Chain is a blockchain technology company. And we do one thing. We partner with financial leaders like Visa to launch blockchain networks. And I want to talk about why, because there's a lot of hype, there's a lot of interest, there's a lot of attention on this space. Uh, but I think to understand why we're all here in this room together, we actually have to go back in time, not too far back in time, specifically to November 2008. And if you refresh your memory, there were some very interesting things in the news in November 2008. Lehman Brothers had collapsed two months before. AIG, Citigroup, and others had received a huge amount of uh, federal bailout funds. Uh, ben Bernanke announced an $800 billion stimulus plan, and someone named Barack Obama won the general election for president. So it was a very, very busy month in financial and world news, and so you wouldn't uh, be faulted for forgetting that or not realizing that something else very profound happened in November 2008. Uh, specifically, an anonymous potentially anonymous uh, paper was published on an obscure corner of the internet. It was really just a math paper or a computer science paper, but within it was a breakthrough, a very singular breakthrough. The idea that we could create a digital bearer instrument, a digital bearer instrument that could be transacted over the internet without intermediaries, or specifically that we could use cryptography to create digital money. And that was a big idea. And so the financial crisis that was at its peak in November 2008, uh, the narrative of that crisis looked like this. That crisis led to regulation, which has made it harder to innovate for financial services. And that's certainly true. But something that is less well appreciated, certainly outside the four walls of this audience here, is that that crisis also led to a breakthrough. And that it's taken a little bit more time certainly, for the world to appreciate and for the financial services community to appreciate. But that breakthrough actually has now shown its ability to enable innovation, to enable financial services companies to do what they couldn't do before encumbered with their infrastructure. And this Bitcoin explosion really set off first a wave of altcoins or other currencies, all of which you could summarize by saying the goal being let's create digital money, but let's do it by creating entirely new asset classes like Bitcoin or Litecoin, uh, Ripple, etc. And those are valuable currencies and they will have value and they probably will never go away because they serve people who are outside of the traditional financial sector or who want to be outside of it for legitimate or other reasons. But something else happened. Uh, and it's more recent, and that is that the underlying technology has proven to be applicable to putting other assets into a digital medium. And the space that we've sort of started to be uh, called blockchain or distributed ledger, uh, I would characterize as having the same goal, which is to say create digital money, but to take a slightly different approach, which is instead of creating digital money by creating new assets, we're gonna create digital money by digitizing existing assets currencies, securities, bonds, loyalty points, gift cards, etc. And that's valuable because when assets are digital, financial services becomes software. And that's at heart the transition that's playing out. That's at heart what's happening now in financial services. One of the last industries to truly be transformed by software. We've seen this happen in music, publishing, telecommunications, and now thanks to this cryptographic breakthrough at the heart of this financial math paper that was published at the nadir of the financial crisis, financial services is going to become software. And that means that payments will become programs, ditto for trades. It means that the infrastructure which powers products is going to be lower cost, more flexible, more dynamic, evolve with business strategy, and that everything can interoperate. 
doesn't mean everything should interoperate. It doesn't mean that securities being cleared in Europe should be on the same network interoperating with gift cards in South America. But if there's a good reason to do that, it's software. But how? There's a lot of confusion out in those halls, uh, in the room, in my own head, in your head. How should we do this? This is not obvious. There's no paper that says, here's the way to create Bitcoin. How do we digitize existing currencies? And there are all of these questions that people ask. Should it be open or closed? Uh, what should the data model be? UTXO, account-based, how about storage? What sort of smart contracting language do we want? What sort of consensus algorithm? How fast does it need to be? How many millions of transactions per second? I mean, these are all legitimate questions, but they're confusing, and more importantly, they're interrelated. If you solve one in an optimal way, it may rule out your ability to, to do another. And so this is actually not a financial engineering problem. It's a software engineering problem. And it's a problem that we've been working on at Chain. And I want to tell you how we've been working on it. Specifically, we have partnered with companies like Visa and several others and started by defining problems clearly, understanding the use cases, and then prototyping features, building them into pilots, launching and testing those pilots. And then today, for the first time at Consensus, we're announcing that we're generalizing that learning over the last two years to a standard and that we've been working with market leaders like Visa, NASDAQ, Fidelity, Citi, and others to do that. And we call it the Chain Open Standard, or humbly, Chain Open Standard 1. Uh, we didn't want to make a big announcement or talk about what we were doing until we were two years into the effort. And even still, it's just like the first day. Today feels like the first day for Chain. Uh, we shorten it sometimes to Chain OS 1. And we summarize it by saying it's a secure blockchain protocol specifically for high-scale financial markets. It's not meant to be for everyone. It's not meant to solve every problem. It's meant to solve the problem of powering high-scale financial markets and moving assets digitally over them. The focus, like I said, is on security and scalability. And the key features are that we have a permission model with a scalable data structure. And those two go together because our consensus system uh, allows for high-scale transaction throughput. Transactions will be encrypted so that privacy is preserved between entities trading on a network. And we support a range of contracting models, including a Turing complete model. You can read more about ChainOS 1 at chain.com slash OS. And I'm pleased to also share today that all of the partners that are building with Chain, whether it be in the Chain Sandbox, which is where we prototype, or Chain Core, which is where we launch production networks, are using Chain OS 1. So uh, to segue now, I'd like to bring up Peter Berg from Visa to talk more about that. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Adam. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you. Uh, as Adam said, my name is Peter Berg, and I look after Visa's venture investments, as well as some strategic partnerships with early stage technology companies. And as many of you may already know, uh, Visa made an investment in Chain last year. Uh, and since that time, we've also partnered to innovate together. Uh, we're very pleased to say we've been part of the journey to develop Chain, uh, Chain's uh, open standard, and uh, we look forward to continuing to work together. Um, while it's a little early for me to divulge the exact details of what it is we're working on, uh, we'll have to save that for a little bit of a later date. Um, what I can say is that Chain OS really represents the culmination of months of iteration and problem solving together with Chain. Uh, and we're very much pleased to be part of the journey and uh, to be building with Chain. Uh, I'm often asked in my role, uh, why did Visa invest in Chain? And more generally, why does Visa care about the blockchain? And I think to really understand the answer to that question, you have to go a little bit back into Visa's history uh, to properly understand the context. So this is DHOC. Uh, DHOC was Visa's uh, first CEO and founder. And the man was far ahead of his time. Uh, already in 1960, before the internet, before mobile phones, before personal computers, D came to the realization that money was not just a coin or a currency or even a credit card. That was form, not function. And in D's view, digital money 
would be a universally accepted global currency. Think about that. In 1960, he already had this vision. And it's, you know, this is very similar to a lot of the conversations that many of us are having today. And, and I highlight this because this vision was with Visa from the beginning, and it also teases out the notion of form and function being complementary, but not prioritizing form over ultimately the functionality. Speaking of forms, this is one I'm sure you're all very familiar with, uh, Visa card. Uh, it's ex existed for a long time and it works, has worked well for decades. In fact, it continues to work very, very well today. Uh, but as digital payment and commerce experiences proliferate and we see more and more of, the, uh, of a move to digital, natively digital commerce and payments experiences, it's incumbent upon us to also evolve and extend our capabilities and services from this traditional model and form factors that we're very familiar with into new and natively digital form factors. So this includes, of course, things like mobile and e-commerce, but it also extends into in-app and contactless or face-to-face -face commerce. And, of course, new technologies and experiences that maybe haven't even been invented or conceived of yet. You know, a lot of people are surprised, given our global footprint, that Visa technically and historically has been a closed network. Uh, and in fact, the only way that you could get access to Visa historically was either being a financial institution or working through a financial institution. And the endpoints were proprietary. Uh, and as part of our evolution, this digital, you know, the evolution to a more digital and natively digital model, we're also changing the way in which we interact with other participants in the ecosystem from something that's closed and proprietary into something that's much more open and collaborative. Uh, so we're taking those endpoints and turning them into APIs and SDKs, which of course is very familiar to all, uh, all of the developers in the room, um, but is really it's hard to overstate what, big, what kind of a big shift that is from our traditional operating model into this new, uh, more extensible and open and collaborative model. And by extension, we're also enabling entirely new categories of players. So back to the, you know, previously only working with financial institutions, now we enable things like, you know, direct payments inside of Facebook or Apple Pay, which is actually built on top of Visa's tokenization engine. So I, I bring all these things up because you know, it, it really speaks to kind of an evolution within Visa, and um, certainly we're supporting all kinds of new experiences today, but we're also looking towards the forward, uh, looking towards the future, to technologies that maybe are here today or also coming. And that brings me back to the topic that we started with, namely Bitcoin, or sorry, blockchain. <laughs> Although, you know, with all, the, with all the news, you know, one came out of the other. So coming back to the blockchain, which is where we started the conversation, um, it's really important for us to evaluate technologies in the context of driving value for our partners and clients. As this room knows better than most audiences that I've spoken to, there are certain interesting characteristics that are native to blockchain technology. Some things you just get for free, right, that come along with it. And it's in that context that we evaluate all kinds of t technologies, including blockchain, to drive ultimately functionality and value for our clients and partners. And our partnership with Chain has enabled us to evaluate and to test and better understand the capabilities that come along with the blockchain. Um, this whole thing ties back into that vision that I shared with you at the beginning, which is uh, form should complement function. And ultimately, it's about the functionality and the value that we dr drive for our clients and partners. And uh, the blockchain and the attributes that come with it are really, um, you know, we're looking at that in the context of driving value for the entire payments ecosystem. And specifically, working with Chain has allowed us to test and to identify re practical, real-world applications of the blockchain in payments and commerce landscape. So I look, very much look forward to continuing to work with Chain. Uh, it's been a great partnership, and uh, we look forward to the journey ahead. So with that, I'll hand it back to Adam. Thanks. Okay, one last thing. Uh, as some of you know, uh, the theme of this conference was, does anyone know? Bitcoin. Making blockchain real. Ah, that's right. So we thought at Chain, wouldn't it be fun to bring a blockchain to the conference and make it real <clears throat> and allow everyone at the conference to participate on a live blockchain? And so what I want to do is announce the winners of this blockchain contest. And as some of you know, the top three traders on our blockchain competition win 
uh, two tickets each to go see Hamilton on Broadway tomorrow night, and they are orchestra center seats. So uh, this is a legit prize. So if you were harassed by someone to trade with you, that's why. Um, I have the winners in my pocket. They're on my phone. Uh, next year, I'm going to get PwC to put them in an envelope for me. <laughs> Before I announce the winners, I want to just tell you a couple statistics. Uh, so we had one live blockchain running on the chain sandbox. Uh, we had actually, at the end, it was close to 500 of you registered for this, which is insane. That's a third of the participants at the conference on a blockchain network, which is really exciting. Um, and 900 trades is also wrong. I got the last update. We have over 1,000 trades in the last 30 hours on this network. So we had a real live blockchain network powering over 1,000 trades between all of you guys. And I will say, before I announce the winners, the gift that you have on your app, uh, you can go redeem from Chain. If you go to the Chain booth, you can swap your gift asset. We'll destroy the asset and give you the physical gift. Uh, so we're like the DTCC of gifts. All right. <laughs> so the winners, the winners uh, are uh, number one, first place with over 100 unique trades, Zachary Kelman. Yes. In second place, Roshina Nandra. Congratulations, Roshina. And we had a tie for third. If you could believe it, we had two people who each had exactly 86 trades, which means we have four winners. And don't worry, uh, both Dev, Beryl, and Stephanie Kent, you're both going to go see Hamilton tomorrow night. So congratulations. So with that, uh, Peter and I want to say thank you. Uh, our contact information is here. And uh, we look forward to seeing you all out in the uh, social session. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Thank you.